Anyone? You're looking at me. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Maggie. Come on. Well, I knew Michael in 1966. I met him when I came here, and I worked on the paper. Mm -hmm. I was actually the last editor of the paper. That's how I met Kenny, was when we were getting rid of the paper and doing all the new stuff. Um, I also knew Michael in uh, San Francisco, and um, I would not ever consider him a hero of mine. Um, I could tolerate the man from that <laughs> we had I wasn't into the drug thing. We had many issues over a lot of stuff. I would not want to repeat some, but but he had he he gave more back than he took, um, and um, so I would like to say that in his honor. You know, and I I was um, he did come hide out at my house um, after. Um, he left Fort Hill, and um, it was, I, I would say, even more than Michael's. The first couple days, he really was a basket case, and it was a very painful experience, and some of the stuff that he talked about that actually went on on a day-to-day -day basis within the Fort Hill community was really quite horrible. And um, so he was fairly traumatized, and I remember when Eric, they sent Eric Peterson, who uh, was um, also a, you know, went to school with us who had joined the Fort Hill community to retrieve him, so to speak. And it was a very bizarre sort of thing. And I, and I think that he actually found himself when he got to California. Um, when he got to California, he was um, uh, spent time building things. He had, be, he had moved in with his sister for a while and became a, a, an interior decorator, which she was. And I think that was before he went to San Francisco. Yes, and that yeah. was in um, Palo Alto. Right. And then he went to um, San Francisco and he helped uh, with the gay collective. He helped to restore a really beautiful old part of San Francisco that's between the Castro and the Mission called Nolly Valley. And, and um, fortunately, there were a lot of gay male couples, not so many women, but um, that were able to buy up those buildings. And Michael was a key player in restoring a lot of old Victorian homes there. And, um, and again, I, I was really proud of him when he started the, being a healthcare worker in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I was really proud of him when he started the, uh, the Radical Fairies, started the collective for health, uh, because we were having a big issue in, in San Francisco with AIDS, it was a big epidemic, of course, yeah. of course. But we also had the cultural issues of some of the cultures in San Francisco, many of the physicians being males, were not um, willing to take care of gay males. You know, it wasn't in their culture to do that. So. So Michael was a real, he did have a way of with words, uh, whether that was verbal or written, and I think he was one of the people who was able to be very persuasive in that area as well. So I have a lot of good things to say. I have no negative things to say. But I, in, you know, in retrospect, I think Michael was a very key player. And, and I'm glad that you could be a, somebody for you to look up to, because I think what you've written has been really um, significant to tell another part of our story, which something other than you know the weather it's right right the, part, yeah. the other part of there was more to it who we were and it was a very complex and, and there's only one other thing i throw in the whole fuck you thing the whole we could find a word and people would stay away <laughs> for days and nights and people hundreds i swear there were hundreds of people would come and go and and i can remember the world started with shit and ended with shit four days later and it was seriously that was the topic and Dozens of people came in, and they were all, and you didn't have to be on drugs. I mean, people <laughs> came in, and the conversation went in all kinds of different free association, and uh, it and it was a wonderful, stimulating um, time. I think. Uh, so. Were you at that talk when Paul Krasner came? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. I was a major fundraiser type, so uh -huh. it was my thing. <laughs> That's good. You know, one thing I wanted to do with with the series is get people who weren't the the um, the name people. I mean, I mean, a lot of the name people gave me testimonial quotes, which is real nice. Tom Hayden, Bill Ayers, Susan Brown Miller. You know, a lot of nice, nice quotes on, in, in my books. But they didn't write the main stories. I wanted people who weren't. You know, the whole idea behind the movement wasn't that you had a few superheroes, you know, leading the way. The the truth was, most of the people who did the work were people we didn't know about. Uh, they weren't famous. Uh, they were not household names at all. But they did major. Work. That's why I had to do such research to find out who the key people were in all the play in the, all the papers because they weren't household names. Anybody else want to throw a few thoughts out? 
Yeah, go ahead. I had a question. Can you explain a little bit more about the nature of the Ford Hill community? I, I'm not familiar with it. Um, well, it was, it was a, a sprawling community. First of all, the guy Mel Lyman, um, some of you may have known of him. Uh, the, the, um, what, what was the, the concert where, where uh, Bob Dylan did, went uh, electric for the first time? Newport. 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 I think Newport. that was the one. There, were, there was a period. The Jim Quest and the Jug Band? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got the album, Mucky. There you go. That's where they got That's where they got most of their money to build for Was Was selling those albums? Right. And it actually had a wall around it, a physical stone wall around Fort yeah. Hill. It's a hill. And I think it's actually in Roxbury. Or, it might be, I'm not sure. But, but right sure. in the Boston area. And, yeah. it, and it was a hill with a wall around it. And they were very, um, they had big buildings, a lot of big buildings where people, lots of people lived in them. And there was a, I don't know, the, the main thing I heard about from Michael was just this um, being sort of told what to do. and. Michael wasn't good at being told what to do. Um, he liked to be the center of things, and um, he wasn't. And but the, they were they were really the whole thing also was there was a lot of sexual components to it, and and drugs, and um, it was really kind of scary when it, you know I know when he came out of there and he came and hit out at our house, he was really um, really freaking out. I mean, they didn't let you get out. You were in. You were in. Was it basically like, like a lifestyle entity? Yeah, it was like a lifestyle okay. thing. And, it, and uh, politically, I never got what their politics were. I mean, they were against the war and stuff, but I mean, everybody was, you know. But I mean, I don't know what their politics were, but I do know that it was a really frightening place to people who got in there. And it was almost like being brainwashed. And he didn't, he was one of the people who got out. But people who got out didn't live very long, some of them either. So I'm not really sure that there wasn't some more. <coughs> going on there because I know the whole time he was with us he was scared to death they're going to find him and what they're going to do to him and, I mean a real fear um, and so um, what happened to it? I don't know eventually it just went away I think I, there's I'm, still some people who are part of it yeah, uh, I mean it's not it's not what it used to be but some of them have gone mainstream I suppose but it was negative it wasn't like I mean the Guru Maharaji at least he was walking around trying to be blitzed out, you know, I mean, everybody, had, they, this was a oh, negative, no. this was a right. really negative, <coughs> sour, controlling and environment, like and I know that he was really, really frightened. I had a friend who got sucked into the Moonies. Did you really? Yeah. 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 He, he was in his compound with, uh, uh, you know, barbed wire around it, his brother saved him from it. So how long was he with him? It was a matter of a few months. Uh -huh. yeah. This is back, uh, back in the 70s. Now, Rennie Davis got sucked into the Moonies. Remember Rennie well, Davis? Well, he was Maharaji <laughs> G. The, the oh, that's, I'm Maharaji sorry. That's what I meant. That's he what I meant. Yeah. Mucky, mucky he became high because he was such a great organizer. If, <laughs> no, he was. I mean, he went from the Chicago 7 to, to the Guru Maharaji. <laughs> Boy Scout, yeah. yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, when they, they had that, that huge... That huge uh, uh, event in, in, in the Astrodome. Do you remember that one? <laughs> he found he organized it. Rennie Davis. But what a what a downer that was. So I looked up to him after Chicago, but after this one it was not quite the same anymore. Anyway, does that answer your question? Maggie answered it better than I could. Yeah. Go. yeah. I was here at that time. I came in sixty four and uh, I was a little farm boy from Iowa, so uh, many of these things that uh, were sort of over my head, but uh, ultimately I got educated. But the one thing that you talked about that you mentioned in the book uh, and mentioned tonight uh, that I was very much aware of, and I just wanted to highlight it a bit further, and I'm probably not saying anything that most here don't already know, but it was big for me at the time, and that was the open housing uh, issue mm -hmm. uh, in East Lansing, and I, I think that it's a foreign subject today, but when I was a student, uh, blacks were not allowed to live in East Lansing. I mean, it was pure and simple, and the only way that um, they could do that was for a white student to go and rent an apartment and then sublet to a black. That's the only way a black person could get off campus. And I had a black roommate when I was a freshman, so 
Uh, maybe that's why, you know, I was uh, aware of this issue, but I just remember just one of my biggest memories uh, of that time, and I've talked about it, I think, ever since, because it was just such a major thing to me that even somebody from Iowa could not understand, especially being in what I thought was, you know, a positive place in East Lansing, that a black student could not move off campus. Uh, and uh, obviously, it didn't take it long to change, and Michael was probably a big reason as to why that change occurred. I can't remember the exact year that uh, that, that changed, but uh, uh, it, it did. Yeah, that was the year the paper was founded. So. There, there were demonstrations of hundreds and hundreds of people in front of Warner Long Realty, the, the biggest and the most prestigious of the realty companies. And it was sort of secret until they used, I think, Bob Green. And they, Bob they, Green was a major, they, a major they, factor they in that, a, correct. They have a, a, a white couple go into the company and look at real estate and show them a bunch of stuff. Then they'd have Bob and Letty Green go in and they'd show them a different set of stuff. And then they'd have the same white couple go, no, a different white couple come back and they'd show them what they show the white couple. And then once that, once the details of that hit the press, it was very widespread through the whole, not just the student here, through the whole Lansing, East Lansing. I remember major, <laughs> four or five hundred people, I thought, downtown, with people on real real Yeah, that Trying to raise your hand or just scratching your no, head? No, I'm just scratching. Oh, okay. My head. <laughs> Any other comments? Any other thoughts? Ancillary. I never heard of the line. Too So I Google him as. Oh, okay. Uh huh. He was memorialized uh, most recently in an album by someone named Landis McKellar. The album is entitled Bath, Michigan. Huh. So, oh, that's the as murder. murder. I think there's a correlation between that. What's that? So, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the murder of the paper thing out there? School bombing? They blew off the school. Yeah, school bombing. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy Jack blew off the school. Yeah, and it, it's actually, it seems. And how does that relate to Mel Lyman? <laughs> I don't think it's, it's an attitude. attitude. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> they, they do have the lyrics you know, to her, too, oh. and it, it points out a little uh -huh. bit of his story. Really? Okay. Okay. It's not doing anything, but it's my bookstore, I felt like saying. Hey, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you own the place, you can do that. Okay. That's power. Okay. Uh -huh. No, the, 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 the politics of, of the Hill were just Mel Lyman. I mean, he was, the, uh, he was the, the guy. He was the god. He had, a, you know, he had his article in every issue, and, and it was always very wordy, and uh, uh, it all came back to him. So that was it. But, uh, his bookstore. What's that? It was his bookstore. <laughs> yeah, his bookstore. Uh, big bookstore. A lot of, a lot of people. But uh, yeah, I'm glad Michael made it out. So, so that was what was ultimately uplifting about the end of the book. So, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit no, just about your second no, yeah. metaphor? Yeah. Oh, sure. What, what do you want to know? Pardon? What do you want to know about the other one? So is it is it also from the other book, or is it additional stuff from the book? There are, did you ever see the first book? Well, the first edition? I have voice, voices from the underground. The, the first edition. You have this one. Okay. Or do you have the, the, the big book? The big. You've got that one? Yeah, of okay, okay. Well, this was... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good enough. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Oh, very good. Well, uh, well there, there, um, all the stories have been updated. The, this book, uh, oh, okay. the, the original book came out in 1993, and a lot of the writers were comparing today, recently, currently, which was 91, 92, 93, to the Vietnam era. So when I decided to do it over again, I obviously couldn't reprint it because then we're going to be talking about today, currently, and to be the 90s. So, uh, so, I, so all of them, I got in touch with all of them again, and they all updated their piece. Now, the only exceptions were Michael, of course, uh, and there were a few other people who weren't living anymore. Uh, uh, Alan Cohn, who wrote a piece uh, about the Oracle, which you may know because you were out west then. Uh, that was, that was the, the major psychedelic paper of the period. Uh, he's not living anymore, and, and there were a, a couple other ones. But other than that, all the pieces have been updated. In addition, uh, there were some new stories. You, being out west, remember a paper called It Ain't Me, Babe? Oh, yeah. Wonderful story in the upcoming volume, volume three. Laura X, you know Laura X? 
Anybody know Laura? Okay, she's one of the, one of the classic people of the period. She she's um, she was, was one who had this huge uh, collection of of literature. She just collected everything, and so the the Laura X archives are tons and tons of of you know mo largely the women's uh, material, but other stuff also. At some point, people knew who she was, and they just started sending her stuff. So and they're in boxes. She's never cataloged them, so they're all in boxes now. But um, but Susan Brown Miller got me in touch with her. Re really interesting. I, I don't know if I told this last time around. Um, when when the first issue, first volume, or first edition came out, and then it went out of print, uh, way too early, uh, and I couldn't get it back in print. But I got a call from Susan Brown Miller, and she said, "I can." This is Susan Brown Miller. I said, "Susan Brown Miller," you know, the what groupie thing. I'm really embarrassed. Oh shit! But um, <laughs> but Susan Brown Miller. Yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, I was just embarrassed. It was such a groupie thing to say, but but I couldn't believe she called me. You know. But she was in the process of, of writing her history of the, of the feminist movement, which maybe you've seen by now. Uh, it's a great story. But back then she was writing it, and she needed uh, uh, There's a history of Off Our Backs in, in the first edition, and also in, in, in this book, the volume, uh, volume one. Uh, and also there's a, a, an appendix to that piece written by Marilyn Webb, who was the, one of the co-founders of Off Our Backs. So she wrote, she wrote a piece about the first year of Off Our Backs, and then the, the, the larger one by Carol Ann Douglas and Fran Moira uh, talks about the, the longer history. So uh, anyhow, Susan wanted to get a hold of that, and I couldn't give it to her, unfortunately. Um, fortunately, she was able to, she got in touch with Marilyn and got, got it from her. But I always remember that. Wow, Susan Brownmiller was really impressed with this. So when I started working on the new edition, I contacted her uh, for a testimonial quote. And, and she gave me a really nice bonus <coughs> on the back of that volume. Uh, and so the next time I was in New York, I went to vis I visited her, and I was so sure she was going to give me a hug. Oh, Ken, what a great book you wrote. You know, I was really looking forward to that. In instead, she opens the door, she sees me, she says, you don't have enough about the feminists in there. <laughs> and, and I tried to explain to her that it's just representative. I mean, I know there are other papers, other black papers, other feminists, other all kinds of papers. There's only so much I can do. She said, you have to have It Ain't Me, Babe. You have to have that. And she said, contact Laura X. And unfortunately, with internet being what it is, I googled Laura X, <laughs> and I found her. But um, but the reason she wanted her, you know, what, what put what put Susan on the map, uh, you know, as far as her fame and all that, her success, is her book about uh, Against Our Will, which was the book that defined rape as a feminist issue. Okay, she was the one who wrote the book. Well, she got the idea of that from reading this article that appeared in this magazine, in this newspaper called It Ain't Me, Babe. And Laura X had written it. Uh, it was an interview with somebody uh, from the staff of It Ain't Me, Babe, who one night had, you know, after after working at the office, had hitchhiked home, got raped along the way, and uh, and and when she she got home and she told her 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 partner, he he said something awfully outrageous. I can't, I can't remember what it was he said, but it was it was totally insensitive. Uh, and he tried to make a joke out of it, basically. And uh, anyhow, so that that. Really uh, inflamed the, the women from being any babe, and so so Laura wrote this this incredible interview with with this person, and and uh, the the, the paper got uh, east, and so Susan's uh, um, uh, group, you know, the consciousness raising group, saw it and passed it around. She read it, and she got uh, she wrote this history. So I mean, this book. So anyhow, so she uh, uh, she said to me, "You got to contact them," and so I did. And so actually, I thought I was done. I had all the pieces edited. I was done. And then she says, you gotta do it in me, baby. And I just thought about it. I could have said to her, no, there's no way, Susan. I'm done, I'm tired, I wanna move on. But I was thinking, hey, what if she wants to review the book? You know, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if I don't include this, I'm gonna get trashed by her. Uh, and I didn't wanna do that. But uh, it was great, it was great, because I contacted Laura. Laura worked with uh, a couple of the other women. Actually, the, the, by the time It Ain't Me, Babe was done, by the time it folded, uh, some of the people had gone in different directions. There was a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know if competitiveness or what, but they had uh, they had gone their separate ways, not necessarily in a positive way. So, so I was really pleased to say that when they all came together to write the piece, they, they brought them together again. That was real nice. And Laura has become a friend of mine. Uh, and and given that this was coming out in volume three, uh, the one that's going to be out real soon, I invited Susan to write a forward to it. So Susan wrote the forward to volume three. So that'll be up really soon. The uh, uh, MSU Press said it should be out in March or April. So it's really right around the the corner. And volume four uh, is going to be out in August. August, September. That's what they're saying. I don't know if it's going to be out that soon, but the fact that they're talking that soon means uh, 
pretty excited about that. Volume four actually is another monograph like volume th uh, two. Um, it's about a paper called Prisoner's Digest International, which was the, the premier uh, prisoner's rights paper during the period. It was put out by, uh, by a group of ex-cons. Uh, they, they went into all the prisons. You know, you had the, the San Quentin correspondent, the Folsom correspondent. Uh, it was a great paper. Joe Grant, uh, Joe Grant is the, is the, was the founder of the paper, uh, and he was the one who actually got me money to, to publish uh, the first edition. So I'm really thankful to him for that. Um, but uh, and Mumia Abu Jamal, he wrote the foreword to Volume Four. Yeah, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, really, really hard to get a hold of somebody who's on death row. Uh, no, I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, I did. I got through to him, and 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 a month after, it doesn't matter. A month after, uh, after he s submitted the piece, he was taken off a of death row, and he's not there anymore. So I'm, of course, taking full credit for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, no, oh, no, Watchburger's involved. We've got to get him out of here. But, uh, so, but he's not on death row anymore, so I've got to update my, my preface. You know? That sort of takes the onus off the previous two, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so those are upcoming. So great stories. I hope you get a hold of those, too. Oh, but the other, uh, hold on. The... Um, so, so It Ain't Me, Babe, is one of the new pieces. That'll be in volume three. Another new piece is um, a paper called New Age, which was a rank-and-file paper. Boy, that came out of nowhere, because in the 60s and 70s, when I thought of labor, what did I think of? The hard hats. Yeah, I mean, that was my, you know, I was not uh, brought up in a, in a labor. I was brought up in a white-collar community. So when I thought of, of the union workers, I always thought of the hard hats. I didn't even think there would be an underground paper. But... Uh, you know, on my website, when, when the books went out of print, instead of saying, go on, never going to see you again, I wrote, um, I wrote, uh, I forgot what it, to, to be published, or, or temporarily. Tempor temporarily out of print. That was the epitome of positive thinking. <laughs> I said temporarily out of print. Uh, and so a guy who, who was on this paper called New Age, he happened to see it, and he contacted me. He said, you're, you're, you're temporarily out of print. When are you going to be back in print? Because I'd like to contribute a story. And uh, by this time, I was already in the process of... of getting it together. So uh, I invited him to write us history, but I, I warned him. I said, these aren't a thousand words. You know, I mean, this is 20,000, 30,000 words. I mean, these are real, real histories. And uh, I said, I'd love to have you, but this is what you have to do in order to get in. And he did it. He wrote a great piece. I mean, there's a lot of editing. We'd go back and forth, but that's how it worked. But he, he's got a wonderful piece. So his is in volume three. And uh, a new one that's in volume one is uh, anybody who heard of a paper called Aquasasni Notes? Yes. No. The piece sent me to subscribe. Did you? I, I it, was, it. it was the <coughs> paper. It was the <coughs> underground paper of the Native American the community. The graphics were gorgeous. Oh, incredible. If you want to know what was happening in Alcatraz, uh, in Wounded Knee, you know, all those, the, those places where, where uh, the Native American leftist community made its mark, you read Aquasasni Notes. It was the only paper you wanted to read to know all that. And, and when I was doing the first edition, I tried to get it. But the guy I was talking to was facing a murder rap. <laughs> okay, and it was a, it was a phony charge. He he obviously beat it. But at that point, when I was trying to get him to write a history, he had other things going on, you know. So uh, and his so he wife could. Is a very famous Joanne Shenandoah. It's Joanne Shenandoah. Yeah, that's his wife. She's a uh, very well known uh, folk singer, Native American folk singer. It's his wife. Uh, but uh, but yeah, when I started doing the second edition, uh, I tracked him down again, and this time he was he was. Uh, in a better space, and he wrote an amazing piece. When Native Americans write histories, you know, they don't go back 20 years, you know, they go back, you know, 500 years, you know, so, so his story goes way back, and, uh, you know, just to talk about a paper that was founded in the 70s, so, uh, but it's a great story, I mean, it's, it, what a wonderful history, and he was, he was the la one of the, the last editors of, of, uh, of uh, Aquasasni Notes, so it's a great story. So those are all new, and, and one other piece, uh, the, the piece that leads off volume three, the, the, the one that's coming up, is a paper called Above Ground, which was a military underground paper from Fort Carson, Colorado. Great story, uh, Harry Haynes writes. He was one of the main historians of, of, uh, the, um, of the military underground press, and ironically, he was gay. Okay, I mean, nobody knew that then, so he wasn't gay. There was no don't ask, don't tell. But, um, but anyhow, he wrote the, this piece, and as an appendix to his piece, he had a list of about 200 military underground newspapers, which was really important, 200 some back then, uh, which was real important. I mean, we hear the whole thing about support the troops, 
Uh, and so it was nice to know that we could support the troops. These were the, these were the troops we were supporting. So we did that, but, but between them, he always said this is not nearly a complete list. He did a, his dissertation on the military underground press, and uh, uh, years ago we both spoke at the same conference about the underground press. I didn't know him, he didn't know me, we didn't meet, but I say, being the pack rat that I am, I saved the program. And so years later, when I was doing this, I leaped through, and I saw, oh, he did a piece on the military underground, and I tracked him down. So he wrote this piece, and he had this, this appendix with him. So I put that, you know, I included that. Years later, uh, yeah, anyone see the film, uh, yes or no, I think, Yes or No, Sir? Or, or what's the name? It's, it's, a, it's about the, um, about the uh, military anti-war movement. And, uh, and there was a section, just a short section, but there was a section about military underground papers. Really, they didn't discuss it a whole lot, but there was one, a couple scenes where they just flashed pictures of underground. And I was watching that, and quickly I was thinking, oh, I don't have that one, I don't have that one, I don't have that one, this one I got. You know? and, and so I wrote them down as fast as I could. Then I played the thing over and over again until I got them all down. And, and I realized that I had to get some more. And then uh, I discovered a book by a guy named James Lewis, who wrote his dissertation on the military underground press. Uh, and, and he is the world's foremost expert on the military underground press. I mean, he's not gonna get anybody who knows more about the military underground press than him. And I got his book, uh, and uh, I looked at, at the back. There wasn't a, a formal appendix, but there was a list of, of books that he, you know, papers that he'd consulted. And I went through that, and there were just a lot of, of papers that weren't on the list. And so I contacted James. And I said, would you be willing to do an appendix to the appendix? And he came up with another 200 some. I mean, we now have over 400 papers uh, in, in volume four. So I mean, it's amazing. I, I look at that. Military, yeah. military underground papers. They were either, either written by members of the military or written by civilians but directed to the military. Uh, in, volume one, uh, in volume one, there's a paper uh, called uh, Freedom of the Press which was written, and that was based in Yakuska, Japan. Uh, it was based out of the coffee shops, you know, the coffee houses. Uh, that's where the, the GIs hung out. And so uh, uh, it was put out by, by uh, some civilians from San Francisco. They went to Yakuska, Japan. They put out this paper. Uh, so it's a great story. But those were, those were, that's an example of civilians uh, writing papers directed to the military. Other papers, uh, most of the papers on the list are actual military. And all the branches, the Marines, the, you know, the, the Navy, I mean, all of the branches are are in there. So it's just an amazing, uh, there, there's never going to be, I mean, historically there never will be a list that's more extensive than that. So, so that's what's new. Thanks. That's what's new. So. Are any papers yeah. at all still around? Fifth Estate is around. Fifth Estate story is going to be in volume three coming up. Yeah. And they sell Fifth Estate right up here on right the here. magazine rack. Do they? Uh, it's not you in Detroit. You should buy one four times a year or whatever. It, it's not in Detroit anymore. I think it's down in Tennessee or something. But, uh, but uh, anyhow, but it's still around off our backs. Uh, the the first first women's uh, it goes on and off, and, and I think it's, it may be electronic now only. Lesbian connection from Lansing. Lesbian connection is, is definitely around. Margie Lesher, our, our founder and editor. Thirty eight. Thirty eight. Yeah. Peace our newsletter. Well, he said it is. I mentioned you in my history. I know you were. Yeah. See, one. I even updated it. Yeah. Yeah. So. So yeah, there are not too many though. Uh, a paper called uh, "Both Sides Now," which was a New Age paper, down in uh, Tyler, Texas, I think. Uh, it's still around. Anything on a lot of the high schools when I was teaching in Detroit at that time? Uh -huh. They put out a dynamite, you know, school paper. Did uh -huh. any of those ever go anywhere? I tried to get uh, one of them uh, into into the first edition. I wasn't able to, but. Uh, but did they, I don't know if they're still around, but they were, they were a powerful force. Yeah. Well, when I worked on Joint Issue, we had a number of high schoolers who, who wrote with us. One guy from uh, Grand Ledge, I remember, got kicked out of school because he was trying to distribute the paper inside. So we were real play, pleased for, you know, getting kicked out of school was a real badge of honor back then. Exactly. So he gave an article devoted to him, you know. I, I don't Until know. you had to go home. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I don't know about Tennessee or anything, but they still have a Ferndale contact post office box okay. in the front. And, and with, by the way, with the, with the, um, the Fifth Estate piece, there's a great, uh, we were talking about cults before. Do you remember when uh, Pat Halley from the Fifth Estate pied the guru? Anybody remember that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
Okay, and then he got the shit kicked out of him. And he got the shit kicked out of him. Oh yeah, he wore he wore a steel a plate till the rest of his life. He's not living anymore, but uh, but he he wore a steel plate for the rest of his life because he he pied, What he did was he posed as as a member of the group, and when when the city of Detroit gave uh, gave the guru the key to the city. I mean, how, how horrendous! So, he, so he posed as a member of the of the uh, of the group. The entourage. Yeah, be. yeah, and he said he was sitting in the front row. He had a robe on, you know, everything that they were wearing. But he had a, a lemon chiffon pie <laughs> 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 underneath <laughs> underneath the robe. And and so at the particular opportune time, he went up to the front and, and pied him, and then just took off. But a couple uh, a couple of his members caught up with him at his, his house and just beat the shit out of him. Just, but anyhow, his story. I, I got him to write it. Uh, so that was the insider story of the, the guy who, I mean, it was one of the legendary moments of the underground press, and so I had to get that one. This has been an absolutely wonderful evening. Thank you so oh, much thank you. For, for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, it was a great experience. It's important. This is history, and and we are all getting older, <coughs> even though I we don't think no. we are. And and so with us gone, we need to make sure that this history is passed down, so that our history is not forgotten. We don't want time or life writing about the '60s. We want people who were part of it to write about the '60s. This is important stuff. That was one of my incentives to get the story back in print. I mean, it went out of print way too soon, and uh, I wanted to get out. And, and uh, yeah, a number of the contributors aren't around anymore, so uh, so we're not going to get them to update it anymore. It's like one of the first Occupy movements. You've occupied the corporate media. And uh -huh. just the same thing. It's so neat. <laughs> the unfortunate thing is it's the same thing. It is. Yeah. Right. That's the depressing part. It is the same thing. It's actually worse. Yeah. In the 60s, there were 1,600 corporations that owned mass media in the United States, and now it's down to five, I think. Getting way down yeah. there. Getting so, way down. You know, so then now they have more control over all the you know, content. And if you do something they don't like, they assign you to do the flower show or something. You know, but we don't have a lot of something. I mean, that you know would expose something or something. We don't have a lot in the way of print. You you. There, there are a lot of good blogs out there, though. A lot of good political blogs. Yeah. Uh, it, does anybody remember an underground paper called the Austin Rag? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there's now a blog called the Rag Blog, and it's the same people. It's the same people doing it. Uh, I mean, check that out. Get it. It's a great group. Um, uh, it's the same people. Same people. Pretty much the same ones. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, and uh, and then uh, Daily Coast. Anybody familiar with Daily Coast? Yeah. Yeah. Real good. Um, the the person who wrote the foreword to Volume One was Marcos Mulitzas, who's the founder of Daily Coast. Uh, and it was real important to me that he write that. Uh, what I wanted to do was was draw the connection between the the underground press and the blogs. I mean, what I'm saying is that the blogs are the successors to the underground press. Uh, and what I'm aware of is the blogs have no idea. The blog, even though the progressive bloggers have really no idea of what we were doing back then. I mean, it's sad, but it's not their fault. It's not like they're stupid. It's, they're, it's not out there. They're not learning about it. And, uh, and so what I wanted to do was have him uh, write a piece in such a way that what he would do was, was show, you know, show the growth that he experienced by reading the book. You know, I wanted him just to say, I didn't know anything about it. I read this, and now, wow, I know everything. Uh, and so I sent him a few chapters, and he got back to me. And he said, Ken, I'd love to write the piece, but i got to be honest, I don't know anything about the underground press. <laughs> and I said, I know that, Marcos. I read your book. And uh, I mean, it was a great book. And he talked about you know, comparing now to then, uh, but, but he never acknowledged the underground. It's not like he said the underground press was good, bad. He didn't even acknowledge it. Like, it didn't even exist. Uh, and so that, that was the point that I wanted to make. And he said, OK, I can do that. And he wrote a really, really nice piece. I'm really, uh, really grateful to him for that. But that's what I wanted to do, draw the the connection between the two periods. Okay. Thank you very much.